obviously we're talking about third wave feminism and how they tend to throw other women under the bus in favor of their political dogma. Just start off by telling us briefly what happened to Cytheria, your colleague, and then why you got so pissed off with how the aftermath of that was handled by feminists. Okay, yeah, sure, happy to, to tell you about that. Um, a colleague of mine, she was a porn performer, she was kind of prolific in the 1990s, was raped in her home. Uh, it was a random attack, from what they can tell. And it, it was quite awful. I mean, these people came in, they were armed, they were juvenile delinquent thugs, um, they beat up her husband, they sexually attacked her, her children were in the house, and she had been retired and she'd come back into the industry recently. So uh, some of us in the industry were pulling for fundraising for her because she can't go back to work. Um, she has PTSD, and et cetera. So at that same time, I've been involved in Gamergate for the past few months, and I've watched the mainstream media consistently and repeatedly highlight cases of false abuse, whether it's Anita Sarkeesian's uh, tweets, you know, claiming that those are harassment, um, or you know, rape threats, or, or whether it's uh, the University of Virginia case. So what I was really angry about, and I'm still angry about, is the hypocrisy of the feminist movement in mainstream media. We had this narrative, uh, we're being fed this narrative, that feminism is about protecting women, it's about supporting women, it's about highlighting rape cases, and yet what we saw, especially with Rolling Stone or with Gamergate, is that it's not. It's been about highlighting cases that are amenable to them. And so here was a celebrity who was raped in her home. It warranted discussion because the context of this case was that obviously there are problems in society right now that are not being dealt with. And so I got on YouTube and I made a rant about it and it um, went viral on, e on a website. And, and I didn't expect that, but it, a lot of people felt my frustration with this. And I know you've talked about it on your show quite a bit, the hypocrisy of the modern feminist, because it seems that they're pushing some narrative. Now, the perpetrators of this horrible crime, and of course mm -hmm. this, this was amidst all the you know, Black Lives Matter movement, that's the right. frame in which this occurred, the perpetrators mm -hmm. were black. Mm -hmm. What role do you think political correctness played in feminists turning a blind eye to this rape case and other particular rape cases? Well, if we look at current feminism, we're really seeing cultural Marxism in action. So you have people who are obsessed with the idea of uh, cultural and, and socioeconomic structures and also the ideas of privilege. So if you look at their, their methodology and their belief system, what you're seeing is if you have a minority male, uh, and I'm, I'm a Puerto Rican female. I'm half. I'm half white, half Puerto Rican. If you see in, in this kind of culturally Marxist structure, because they believe that people of color or black males are somehow lower on the totem pole, it, they're, they're reticent to actually call out problems within a, a cultural subgroup. And what we saw with Black Lives Matter, what we see with the FBI crime statistics is that there is a problem of violence in black communities. Is it because of race? I don't know. It likely has a lot to do with socioeconomics. Unfortunately, I'm not a sociologist, so I, my understanding of it is, is very surface level. But I think when you're talking about the feminist groups and third wave feminism, you're talking about entitled, largely white female progressives who are cultural Marxists and they are reticent to critique anybody other than white males. And, you know, you mentioned the statistics there. Obviously, I've talked about the whole, you know, black people being responsible for 50% of homicides, despite the fact they only make up 13% of the population. On the right. flip side, we had feminists claiming that one in five women who go to college are likely to be victims of rape. The Justice Department figures came out, and it was actually 0.03 out of five were raped, which is less than the actual general population. So mm -hmm. normal women in the general population are more likely to be raped than young women who go to college. Rape mm -hmm. itself has declined by 58% between 1994 and 2010. So they were peddling this whole hoax rape scandal, particularly mm -hmm. through the, the UVA story, which completely collapsed and crumbled into a complete farce. 
That was right. debunked. Then we had, you know, walking while female, this video of a woman walking through New York for 10 hours, 10 mm -hmm. hours, mainly through poor ghetto areas. And then what was amazing about it was when people pointed out in that video that most of the, quote, hecklers, and, you know, most of those comments were complimentary. A couple of them were actually harassing out of 10 hours of footage. But people pointed out that most of those comments came from minority groups. Mm -hmm. When that was raised to the attention of these video makers, they said that there were actually more, um, there was more harassment from white people, but it just wasn't picked up on the video because the audio was too quiet. So for me, that's yet another example of how they will deliberately lie in order to dismiss the fact that a lot of this rape culture emerges from minority groups, from black people, which is not because they're black. It's not because of their skin color. It's because the culture um, promotes that kind of attitude. I mean, just look at rap and hip hop lyrics. That's what's being promoted in their culture. So that's why they exhibit it. I mean, what did you think about the walking while female video in New York? Well, I mean, the walking while female video was, um, in my opinion, it was a perfect example of cherry picking and goalpost moving because what they did was they purposefully set up this woman to, to create this scenario. They put her in tight jeans. They put her in a, in a ghetto neighborhood. Um, my family's from Puerto Rico. If I walk around in Puerto Rico, I will elicit more response from the men generally than if I walk around in Los Angeles. It's a cultural thing. The other thing is, if you notice, what they, the feminists did was any sort of comment that was made on the street, whether it was, hey, beautiful, how you doing? Hope you're having a beautiful day, beautiful. Things like that that are actually, you know, within a culture not considered to be harassment were taken as harassment simply because uh, the man spoke to this woman. Now, the irony of this is that these are people who are so against racism, but yet when a poor black man says, hey, beautiful on the street, it's harassment. If a wealthy white man that she was attracted to had said the same thing, would it be considered to be harassment? This is the devil standard that these people like to live within. And this is the problem with it. They had, there's a covert racism structure that, has, that exists within cultural Marxism that they exhibit. They project their issues onto the world. And further, um, they did a, a rebuttal video on this. A man walked through West Hollywood and he elicited quite a bit more harassment on the street than this woman did in New York City. So uh, all of this to me is really counterproductive to gender relations because what it does is it makes women afraid of men in society. It's going back to the uh, rape statistics that you, that you just mentioned. Uh, it's interesting that these people who live in a bubble are more concerned about uh, the, this idea that rape happens on college campuses, it's one in five. Well, again, how are we measuring this? Are we talking about violent rape or are we talking about, oops, I slept with that guy and I regret it now? I mean, they had that, that article that you ran about, uh, I don't know what they're calling it, regret rape essentially. I mean, this is, it, it's gotten to the point of absurdity where now if a man looks at a woman the wrong way, he's considered to be stare raping her, which in my opinion is exceedingly diminishing to women who've, who've experienced real sexual violence. And going back to this whole feminist hypocrisy on rape, we see it time and time again. I mean, in Britain, we've had numerous scandals over the past several years in places like Rotherham, Rochdale and Oxford, where mm. we have groups of Pakistani Muslim men who kidnap and sexually abuse literally hundreds of young white girls, that's who they prefer, white girls, and actually in Rotherham there was a huge cover-up by the authorities, by the local Labour Council and the police, because they didn't want to bring these people to justice, these paedophiles basically, for fear of being appearing politically incorrect or racist. And this scandal went on for 10 years or more in one area alone. Then there were other scandals in Rochdale and Oxford that were similar. So again, you know, complete tumbleweeds from feminists every time, complete silence. In Scandinavian countries like Denmark, Sweden and Norway, you have rape completely off the charts. In Sweden, it's up 1400% since the mid 70s. 77% of the culprits are identified as, quote, foreigners. You have a similar situation in Denmark and Norway, where it's predominantly 
Pakistani Muslim rape gangs that go around abducting young girls and raping them. And nobody wants to talk about it. Nobody even wants to prosecute them. For years and years, it's covered up. And the feminists are completely silent on it. I mean, why is that? Well, my opinion of all of this um, harkens back to what we were just discussing in terms of modern third wave feminism really being driven by cultural Marxism. So uh, their, their ideology doesn't leave space for the idea that uh, men who are minorities can in some way be aggressors. And this is why it's so damaging. This is why it's such a problem. This is why it's so dangerous. Uh, you had, I, I heard about the case in the UK. I mean, just recently this happened in Israel as well. A, an African immigrant grabbed a woman in broad daylight and attempted to sodomize her. And if it weren't for another Israeli woman seeing this and calling the police, he would have succeeded. I mean, this is insane. And so if we are not responsible culturally, and we don't look at this thing, you know, there each different cultures have different standards. We know this. If we look at uh, especially certain sects of Islam, we see it's such a different standard in terms of, of uh, wife abuse and child abuse and sexual abuse. This is not a surprise to anybody who has their eyes open, but unfortunately, because of cultural Marxism, we are not allowed to say it lest we be labeled as racist or, or as uh, people who are bigots. I find that to be really a shame and it will take us backward in terms of, of the progress that, that society has marched forward on. I mean, it, it, we see it in, in America too. We see a glorification of thug culture, let's say, you know, and uh, I, I understand each culture's need to express itself artistically however it wants, but I also have to say, well, how much of this is, if these people want to highlight the issues, if they want to say we have a problem in society, then it's really foolhardy to not point to the fact that a lot of these issues are cultural. Uh, I think a lot of it is socioeconomic. I think that because it's socioeconomic and it's common that different cultures or, or different countries or in you know in varying scales in, in in terms of socioeconomic progress people especially cultural Marxists want to make it about race when it's really not it's about culture and it's about money and until they address this it will not get better we're seeing this I mean the 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 young men who um, raped Cytheria were black the problem with that also is that it really diminishes all the young black men that are out there that are not rapists and that are doing the right thing. So ironically, by not addressing this, we're actually creating a situation where we're hindering the progress of those who, who are not criminals. And you mentioned cultural Marxism again. This is the idea that oppression, that all forms of oppression, and for feminists it's intersectional, which means mm -hmm. cross race, gender, everything you care to name, comes from the dominant culture, not from the state. And through that definition, they then use it to blame the evil white Western male patriarchy for foistering right. that, that oppression, when in fact, as we've just documented, you know, rape has gone down in the West you know, consistently over the past 20 years. The college rape scandal has been debunked as a complete myth. The only mm -hmm. real rape scandal is amongst these Muslim immigrants in many countries who bring across their own basically backward values. That's part of their culture there. It isn't here. And yet there's complete silence on it. So that in itself completely demolishes the idea that cultural Marxism is a form of oppression in that it comes from the dominant Western white male culture, which the statistics show it clearly doesn't. I want to move on now, though, to um, sex positive feminists and those who oppose them, of course, there are some sex positive feminists, but it appears that more and more we're seeing this new breed of Puritan control freaks who kind mm -hmm. of want to deny women choice and prevent them from using their own beauty to become successful in mm -hmm. their chosen careers. They want to revoke them of that choice. We've seen efforts to ban booth babes at video game conventions. We've seen just today, in fact, one of the big motor racing organizations has banned grid girls, these women that stand on the starting grid of the motor race with umbrellas. 
you know, there was an effort to ban page three in Britain. So again, you know, it's feminists putting other women out of work. And it's kind of this new bizarre strand, which seems to be getting quite dominant, which punishes women for making choices with what to do with their own bodies and beauty. Doesn't that go against everything that true feminism should stand for and that it should encourage strong, independent women to choose whatever career path they want? Well, again, I mean, I hate to tie it all back to cultural Marxism, but I'm, I'm going to do that here because it's appropriate. Go for it. Um, <laughs> if you look at second wave feminism, it operated under a very capitalistic premise and structure. And, and by capitalism, I mean true capitalism, not crony capitalism. There's a difference, and I think people forget that. But uh, second wave cap, uh, feminism operated under the premise of people should use whatever tools they had to their disposal. Really, it, it was a matter of freedom. Second wave feminism was born from the idea that women didn't have the freedom and the agency to pursue whatever they wanted. Uh, that was remedied. This, that's an old conversation. Third wave feminism is actually doing exactly what we can expect. As cultural Marxists, they are moving backward, right? So if you look at the statistics, there's a corollary between, and I don't want to say there's a causation link, but there's a corollary between uh, the availability of internet porn and a decline in real world sexual violence. Uh, it's been hypothesized, some people want to create a causation link, but it's more likely that societies that are more free, societies where there's liberty, people are less likely to act out violently. It's also hypothesized that people who are able to psychologically work out their um, violent sexual um, fantasies virtually by watching pornography are less likely to enact them in the real world. It's no surprise that pornography is typically banned in the countries that truly still have rape culture. I mean, when third wave feminists talk about rape culture on college campuses, they're really diminishing the fact that there are countries where true rape culture exists. Pakistan is a perfect example of this. Um, there were soldiers from the UK who came back who had been stationed in Pakistan. He said, there's, there's a true rape culture in Pakistan. They are, they're raping children. That is something that's happening. Third wave feminists don't want to talk about it because they, they want to regress society. And so then it naturally goes to follow that they take the lead. They actually lead us backward into uh, wanting to limit people's freedoms. If you look at sex positivity and, and one thing I enjoy about pornography is how uh, it's really such a great uh, way to see where somebody stands on, on free speech and First Amendment rights, because a lot of people will claim that they're libertarians to me, but then when it comes to pornography, they're actually social conservatives because they don't like that free speech. And uh, it's the same thing with the, the progressive third waivers. They claim that they want women to be empowered, but then they actually want to shut down careers where women, or only women, can get ahead. You know, you look at pornography, there are very, very few true male um, stars, and there are quite a few female stars who, who, and women generally make two to three times or more what the men make in that industry. They would like to shut that down. Uh, and you see, there's kind of a creep, and I've said from the beginning when I started to observe this, uh, we'll talk about Gamergate shortly, but these sex-negative feminists uh, have gone after games, they've gone after heavy metal, they've gone after every sort of entertainment that, let's say, largely white, middle class and affluent males in, in Western society enjoy. They want to limit people's freedoms, and because of their own bubble and their own context, they see uh, the men of their culture as oppressing them. It, really, most of it's an illusion. Uh, people who talk about patriarchy or misogyny at length tend to be covering for the fact that they are personally inept and aren't able to su succeed in society. So they want a scapegoat. They want a reason for that as opposed to looking at themselves. This is the problem with third wave feminism. There's a real lack of personal responsibility. And this is because we have, we are now being trained, especially academics are being trained not to offend people. Um, it's creating a structure where everybody has to kind of bow down to this this temple of emotionality that they've created. And now it's it's bizarre to see that these sex negative feminists now share more in common with ISIS. And I don't mm -hmm. say that like lightly because you know we've had ISIS 
tearing down artwork across the Middle East that offends them. And now we Mm -hmm. have feminists doing the same. In fact, the Athena tennis girl, you know, this iconic poster image from the 70s. In fact, the Wimbledon Tennis Club organization wanted to include that in a in a convention in a feature presentation of different artwork related to tennis they merely tweeted out this image which is famous and well liked all over the world and the everyday sexism twitter handle came down hard on it they they organized a phony hysterical outrage campaign and the wimbledon tennis club had to apologize for tweeting out this piece of art which is basically what it is um, mm-hmm. Because it's, you know, it's offensive to feminists, yet Kim Kardashian can get up there and show us her rotund, implanted, bulbous behind, and nobody mm-hmm. bats an eyelid. So again, it's another double standard, isn't it? But wouldn't you agree that now the greater threat is that feminists being so unhinged and so obsessed with subverting art forms, which is Gamergate, what we'll get, what we'll get onto... That is a real threat because not only do they have their, you know, their grubby hands under the bowels of the education system with gender studies, now they're actually trying to censor and subvert different art forms. Right, right. Well, and, and Camille Paglia did a wonderful um, interview on that that you posted, which is, and she's an iconic feminist. She's been really uh, maligned by most modern feminists for saying exactly that. The, the problem that we have right now as a society is, we are, is this idea that we should apologize, that everybody should apologize for offending other people. The reality is that if they're offended by it, they simply cannot view it. Free speech does not mean that you get to not be offended. And we can choose what we view. That's the liberty that we have. I mean, the Athena poster was probably one of the least offensive and, and kind of, it's really kind of a charming historical piece. The fact that they apologized, every time someone apologizes, it sets a precedent that we all need to apologize for offending people. Um, part of the reason that Arthur Chu and a lot of these people don't like me is I don't apologize for offending people. I think people should be offended consistently. and. Uh, there are a lot of people who do a lot of things that that I may or may not like, but I can choose what I what I pay attention to. Really, modern third wave feminists are looking for things to be offended by, and that's part of the problem. They are literally nitpicking. We saw the same thing with Shirtgate. Um, here's a senior scientist who landed a ro- robot on a comet. I mean, it was a phenomenal feat of engineering and uh, Western science, really. And he had a shirt with pinup girls on it, designed and made by a female friend of his, by the way. Uh, and it was a charming shirt. And the, these uh, women went out of their way to be offended by it. And, and really, they made him apologize on, on television. He was crying. I mean, it was absurd, which should have been such a hallmark moment for a, a great individual who's furthering science was marred by the feelings of of these really this inept group of people and we will move backward as a society if we keep allowing people's feelings to trump logic and reason and that's my concern and it's it's you know i make the point over and over again liberals try to define themselves as tolerant people yet Uh routinely they're the most intolerant people on the planet towards Mm -hmm. anyone who dares dissent or disagree with their views. We've seen it again with the memories pizza farce that's going on at the moment. So mm. again, it gets to the point that this term liberal or liberalism has been completely hijacked. They're not liberals. Classical liberalism as it was originally defined meant something completely different back mm. in the last century. And they've hijacked it. It's not about tolerance. It's about authoritarianism and social engineering. And we mm. see that with Gamergate. Let's talk right. about the fat pride movement now, though, because I made a video on this a couple of months ago. It's got about, you know, 200,000 views already. Mm-hmm. And it's basically, again, feminists promoting a social justice warrior movement, which is incredibly harmful to women. Mm-hmm. This right. idea that morbid obesity is not a health condition, even mm-hmm. though in the UK alone it costs 10 times more money than it costs to treat diseases related to smoking, morbid obesity. And I pay for that 
through my tax money. Yet it's mm -hmm. now almost being celebrated, not only by feminists, but by many quarters of the media and certain corners of the fashion industry, mm -hmm. that not only, this is not about women being curvy, this is about obesity. And it's now mm -hmm. being celebrated um, with the fat pride movement, criticism of which is now mm -hmm. being treated as a thought crime. There was an expert in the UK last week, Dr. Sarah Jackson, who said mm -hmm. mocking the obese should be illegal. There was a television show in Britain a couple of months ago where a journalist asked why somebody was unable to lose weight. And one of the other fat pride activists called the police on her to report her for hate speech. So again, mm -hmm. they're putting it in the same bracket as racism and sexism. It's this intersectional idea of feminism where criticism of obesity is the same as being racist or sexist, despite the fact that you don't choose your gender, you don't choose your race, but you do choose to overeat and become obese. And it's, it has been embraced by feminists. This is the new bizarre branch of third wave feminism. And again, it's all about this obsession with policing thoughts right. and creating victims of women, which again is incredibly harmful to women because of the mm -hmm. myriad of terrible health conditions associated with obesity. What's your take on it? Well, I think that all of this ties back to the disdain that third wave feminism has for personal responsibility in any form, I, whether it's someone's weight, whether it's their career advancement, um, what we see is a consistent thread of it's always somebody else's fault. And everybody should, I should be successful for doing absolutely nothing. So, so if we look at fat acceptance and there are people with medical conditions who are overweight or obese. I mean, there's some people who can't ha help this. But the percentage of those people to the general population of people who are obese is very, very small. Yeah, it's the a minority. Right. And so the, the reality of it is, like I work in the adult entertainment industry. Um, most performers in that industry spend at least an hour a day at the gym. That's how people get to look how they look. Their bodies are on display, so that's important to them. Um, it's, if you look at modern third wave feminism, and, and somebody had posted a, a cartoon of this, of the double standard, where it had a cartoon of an obese man with a hot young woman, and it said, <laughs> oh, you filthy pig, how dare you? And then there's an obese woman with a hot young man, oh yeah, you go girl. So they're not being realistic about the world. A lot of these third wave feminists who, who preach body positivity are, this, are the same ones that in the next breath will blame all men for uh, not giving them attention or what have you. But again, there's no personal responsibility and it is a health issue. I mean, we're not talking about people dyeing their hair all kinds of weird colors. I don't, I really don't care what people do with that. But when you have a, a health system that's being funded by taxpayers, we, we should all, we should all feel a responsibility to each other in society. And we should all feel a responsibility to our, ourselves to live the best lives that we want. Unfortunately, this victimhood mentality has pervaded all pieces of society. We can go back to why that is, whether it was um, the institution of socialized anything in society, and a lot of people do that. I think it's really gone too far. And if, if people want to be obese, they should also be responsible for the consequences of that. Exactly. It, I mean, you know, I smoke. And there is smoker shaming, again, despite the fact that it costs 10 times less on socialized health care. And I agree mm -hmm. that it's a bad habit and it would be right. the height of ridiculousness to promote that as something that should be acceptable. And right. that to, quote, shame anybody for smoking is to somehow offend them deeply and is somehow linked with racism or sexism. I mean, that, that is the direct equivalent, isn't it, with this fat shaming movement? Well, it, it is a, it's a very direct equivalent because smoking is a personal choice. Um, the unfortunate thing is, you know, really if we look at modern third wave feminism right now, it's really no different than the No Child Left Behind Act. It's the No Woman Left Behind Act. And so what they've done is they've dropped the bar and they've said, okay, let's set the bar to the lowest possible place. If you're alive and a female, you have value and you should be treated as inherently valuable. Now, notice with third wave feminism, it only applies to their subset of women. 
doesn't apply to uh, women of color or women of, of a low socioeconomic status or women who do jobs they don't like, as the, in the case of Cytheria. It, it has to do with women who fit their, their narrative. So you, you see that all of this is really coming from their deep psychological issues and, and the fact that they know that they're not being personally responsible, they're not getting the results that they want and they want to blame society for it. If I eat junk food all day and I never go to the gym, I will get fat. Is that anybody's fault but my own? No, but we live in a society where people will instead sue McDonald's for getting fat as opposed to being responsible for the fact that they've been eating 5,000 calories a day in junk food. It's, I mean, this has been going on for years, and I think we're starting to really see it come to a head in this generation. And, you know, I think it was Sargon of Akkad put out a video the other day making the point, we live in a meritocracy, and you can mm -hmm. apply this to the pay gap, you can apply it to everything. How much mm -hmm. of this um, body acceptance movement is down to the fact that, you know, a lot of these feminists are black, glasses rimmed wearing fat and quite ugly, and how much mm -hmm. of their grievance is based in the fact that they are unsuccessful with men, mm -hmm. and they've turned that into some kind of bizarre social justice warrior cause instead of, you know, addressing their own internal insecurities. How much is it, you know, directly attributable to that? All right, I think, I think when you see people who go on crusades in society, against some subgroup that they perceive to be threatening it's usually it usually has to do with some deep-seated psychological issue and um, we see this with the anti-porn activists too I mean a lot of the women who are anti-porn activists it's not really a surprise or Andrea Dorkin was a perfect example of this these are women who really are jealous and, and angry about uh, their lack of appeal to men and so it's easier to blame the actresses than it is to be personally responsible I, you know, and it's, it's ironic it's really ironic because they're not cultivating um, any sort of personality of, of worth I mean I think I think all people really um, have an opportunity to grow and, and be people of value however they look. But the problem is a lot of these, these third wave feminists are unattractive and they have unattractive personalities. So it's not really a surprise that they're unsuccessful generally in the world. It's, it's kind of a refusal to face reality and play the mm -hmm. cards that you're dealt. Mm -hmm. um, it's the same, you know, if, if you lack the basic skills to rise up the ladder and become a CEO, then that's because you lack the basic skills. It's not because of your gender. It's the same right. with, you know, attractiveness. You, if you, you have to play the, the hand you're dealt. You can't then blame it on the uh, beauty and cosmetics industry conspiracy. That's what Naomi Wolf does. She wrote a mm -hmm. whole book and gave numerous speeches saying that men being attracted to fertile, thin, pretty women mm -hmm. is not a natural, innate thing, that it's this grand conspiracy that we've all been brainwashed to believe by the right. beauty and cosmetics industry in direct violation of basic science mm -hmm. which tells us about the hip to waist ratio in terms of how attractive women are to men. It's, it's, it's completely at odds with basic biological reality yet they get right. up on stage, they write books about it and then mm -hmm. as you mentioned you know you don't see them championing the cause of obese men, that's not part of it and in fact they still freely objectify men there was an article in Jezebel, which is a big feminist publication, where the assistant editor responded to a complaint by the Game of Thrones actor. I forgot his name. I don't watch it, but it's one of the main mm. Game of Thrones actor actors that he was mm. being objectified by women. She responded to that by calling him, quote, a penis on the end of a sword. This was in a feminist publication that would normally be horrified at the objectification of women, and now they do exactly the same thing to men. So it's that double standard again, isn't it? Well, it is. And it's also what I've noticed that those women who, who like to use or throw around the word objectification often don't know what it means. I, this is not surprising. They, many, many of them don't understand language and most of them don't understand science, which is how they're able to misread a statistic that says 0.03% of, of women on a college campus are raped. They turn that into one in five. I mean, it's, 
it's an absurdity. They don't have a basic understanding of science and mathematics. They don't have a basic understanding of logic. Not a surprise, most of them go to school for, um, for topics that don't require such things, heavily biased, uh, subjective, peer review, things like that. So uh, when it comes to objectification and a common complaint against my industry is, well, the women are, are being objectified. Actually, that's completely untrue. And if you watch any of the videos, usually uh, the women are the subjects that are being personalized. You might uh, have footage of, of objects on a body, but if you notice, the men are actually the true objects in the experience. Many times their faces aren't shown, their personalities don't matter. They don't bring this up. They, they like to instead focus on their narrative that women are victims. Any woman who tells you women are victims is really telling you, I'm a victim. They're not, they're not um, able to discern their personal subjective life experience from that of the world. And talking about, you know, not understanding the meaning of words, mm -hmm. feminists routinely will send me the dictionary definition for feminism and say, you don't understand the meaning of feminism, when in fact, it's them that doesn't understand the meaning of feminism, mm -hmm. equality for men and women, and yet then they go and post tweets about, oh, it's not about that, it's about the supremacy of women, it's about kill all men, you know, it's about right. Sheryl Sandberg ban bossy and this new campaign she came up with basically saying that men were losers who are not doing enough housework and that they need to do more laundry so it's mm -hmm. you actually delve down into what these feminists say not only in their publications but on their tweets and it's got right. nothing to do with equality and yet they send you the definition of feminism as if you don't understand it when they don't understand it Right. Well, I think a lot of them actually haven't really self-assessed what they believe. The, a lot because you're dealing with people who are reacting purely on emotion and not on logic. So they literally ha have the inability to understand what they mean by what they say. A good example was the hashtag "Kill All Men," and I got into quite a few fights about this online. Which is, how is it? how is it okay to ever suggest that an entire gender should be killed? And, and I brought this up and they said, well, it's a joke. Now, if I made a hashtag kill all women, that would not be okay. So again, this is their double standard. A lot of these people are true misandrists. They, they really hate men, even the male feminists. They're, they're flogging themselves in apology for what they perceive to be the, the uh, historical supremacy of men, which, by the way, I mean, they are so diminishing about that. But if you look at society and technological progress, which I think tells the story of a society's progress, you'll notice that under the structure that they call patriarchy, humans made tremendous progress. And to negate that and to disempower men uh, because we are we feel bad because we had a bad experience at some point with some man is, is really foolhardy for society. If you look at matriarchal cultures, most of them never made technological progress. We're still living in grass huts. And, and, and how are we supposed to glorify this? I mean, I like men and I am happy to see there, there are true biological differences in the way men and, and women process information and also in the, in the things that we build. I mean, this has been put to the test for eons, but because at some point in the, these radical feminists, and feminism wasn't always like this, but these radical feminists like Dworkin um, hated men so much that they started to publish drivel that suggested that, that biology is not in place and that it's all social conditioning. We see that with uh, Wolf's work as well, it, which is insane. It's insane to say that uh, biology is the result of social conditioning. People are attracted to healthy, fertile people. It's very simple. Of course, young, attractive women are sending the signal biologically that they are fertile and that they are healthy. Beauty is usually an indicator of health. So, so for these people to negate this, I mean, they're creating a society that's really very uh, akin to this 1984 structure, you thought crimes, and, and they want to pretend that science doesn't exist. It will be their downfall.